Sociology Robot. Hello and welcome to the 10th video lecture on OCR A-Level Sociology for Paper 1, looking at the nature-nurture debate. What we're asking is whether our social behaviour is mainly due to our biology, that's the nature side of things, or our upbringing and environment, and that's the nurture side of things. Or is it a combination of both? The most crucial part of this debate is the question, which side counts for the most? So let's look at nature first of all. Uh, by nature, we're talking about the characteristics which are innate, the things you are born with. Now, I need to introduce a little distinction here about maturation. Innate characteristics might take time to appear. Uh, maturation means that as you grow, eventually things emerge in your character that were always there. Perhaps you had the genes for them, but they take a while to come out. People who believe in these innate or essential characteristics are nativists, and this viewpoint is sometimes called essentialism. The idea that there are some essential characteristics that define a biological man or woman or child or adult. Some of the most interesting research into this takes the form of twin studies, looking at identical twins who share the same genes, but might turn out differently due to their different upbringings. Here are some examples of innate characteristics that we have because of our nature. Eye colour would be one. Fingerprints would be another, but fingerprints are not the result of your genes. The wrinklings on your skin that create your distinctive fingertips uh, happen in the womb, so identical twins might not have identical fingerprints. Puberty, this would be an example of maturation, where hormones are released, bringing about changes in your body and perhaps personality. There are, of course, controversial aspects of the nature side of the nature-nurture debate. One of them would be intelligence. Are people born with an innate intelligence, which perhaps because of maturation, requires several years before it starts to show itself. This is the basis of the famous 11 plus test that used to exist all over Britain and still does in some parts of the country, my part of the country, which assumes that by the age of 11, innate intelligence will have revealed itself in children so you can test them and work out what sort of school they should go to. Another controversial aspect of the nature debate is on sexual orientation. Are people born straight or gay? Even more controversial at the moment is the issue of gender, whether people are born male or female, or whether they develop male and female identities because of the way society treats them. An awful lot of the nature side of the nature-nurture debate boils down to Lady Gaga's phrase, born this way. Were you born with these essential characteristics? Or, had you had a different upbringing, would you have turned out to be a completely different sort of person? Over on the nurture side of the nature-nurture debate, we've got the idea that human characteristics are a social construct that we've learned from our upbringing and experience. And if that upbringing and experience had taken a different form, then we would be very different people. Now, of course, it doesn't feel that way to us. Everybody feels as though they have to be the way that they are and that they couldn't have been any different. But you can't trust your feelings on this. The social construct approach would say that we have learned these things, that they are not essential to who we are. 
So there are some good examples of nurture. I think language would be the best one. Very clearly, people all over the world speak different languages. Everybody is born with the ability to learn a language, but nobody is born with a language inside them just waiting to come out. We can also see very clearly with fashion and taste that this is nurture. You only have to look at the fashions from a few decades ago in the 1960s here and see how quaint or funny they look. Uh, but at the time, of course, those fashions felt to people as though they were extremely attractive and sophisticated. Clearly an example of ideas and behaviour being influenced by our social situation. And more broadly, the issues of culture that the past few video lectures have been about would seem to come from nurture. But we can revisit these controversies again. Can you raise a child to be intelligent? From this we get the idea of hothousing children with private tutors and sending them to intensive schools in order to make them as intelligent as possible. And then the sexual orientation. Can you raise a child to be straight or gay? Or does the orientation have to be there to begin with? Recently, we've had similar controversies about gender. Here is the entertainer Sam Smith, who identifies himself as non-binary. Now again, is this the way that Sam Smith was born? Or has Sam Smith developed this identity through social experience? Gender is probably one of the most contentious areas in the nature-nurture debate. Are men and women essentially different? Are they born with different characteristics and outlooks? Or are, is this distinction between male and female, masculine and feminine, something that people get from society? Let's look at a couple of familiar key scholars on the Nature Nurture debate and one new one. Here's Talcott Parsons. We've seen quite a lot of him already, the influential American functionalist from the 1950s. You will remember that Talcott Parsons argues for socialization, which of course is the nurture side of the nature nurture debate, but he also believes that there are biological differences between men and women that makes them suited to different roles. Males to the instrumental role of going out and being the breadwinner and making money, and females to the expressive role of making a home and raising children and providing emotional support. Now, Parsons thinks that these biological differences are hardwired into people. That's nature. So although you could have a house husband who stays at home and follows the expressive role, and you could have a business career woman who goes out and does the instrumental role, Parsons thinks that going against your biological nature in this way will, for many people, if not everybody, lead to problems. You can imagine that many feminists would regard his views as deeply sexist. We've also looked at Margaret Mead, the pioneering American anthropologist who did her field studies of uh, family arrangements and gender roles in Papua New Guinea and Samoa back in the 1920s. And here is Mead's famous book, Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies. And I'll draw your attention once again to the Chambuli, a tribe where the traditional gender roles were reversed, with the women being aggressive and dominant, and the males being more passive and interested in personal beauty. Mead's book is great evidence for this social constructivist view that socialization can construct any sort of culture, and things like gender roles are learned from nurture, not given to us by nature. Now this is Judith Butler, a third wave feminist, who challenges the idea that there is anything innate about being a woman. Here is Butler's celebrated book Gender Trouble from 1990. Now Butler argues against essentialism in gender. She says that gender is performative, it's a sort of act that people put on, but it becomes real because it is acted out in society. She doesn't believe that gender has got any basis in biology. This would be an extreme social constructivist view. It certainly was at the time, although it's become a lot more mainstream since then. 
Let's look at a couple of interesting applications for the nature-nurture debate in some real-life case studies. First of all, the case of Jeannie Wiley, who was a tragic victim of domestic abuse. She was rescued from her abusive family when she was 13, and she had spent her entire childhood strapped to a chair in an upstairs room by her mentally deranged father. This had been going on since she was a toddler. She'd never learned to speak because nobody had spoken to her. She'd never learned to chew food because she'd been given baby food. She couldn't straighten her arms or legs. She'd never learned to use the potty. This came about from an absolute lack of human affection or intellectual stimulation in her life. After some intensive therapy with psychologists, she did learn to speak a few words, but then there was a terrible setback. She was sent back into the care system, suffered abuse again, and stopped speaking altogether. The case of Jeannie seems to speak about the importance of nurture, that human beings need a certain environment, have, needs to have certain experiences in childhood in order to become fully functionally human. A very different but equally tragic study is in the case of David Reimer. David was raised as a girl because in a freak hospital accident his penis was damaged in infancy and his parents, guided by a radical sex therapist, Dr John Money, decided to keep his true birth sex from him and raise him as a girl named Brenda. Brenda was very unhappy as a girl and by her teenage years, was suicidal. Her parents told her the truth. You were born a boy. Brenda learned this at age 14 and immediately reverted to being a boy, taking the name David. David Reimer had an unhappy adulthood and tragically committed suicide in his late 30s. His study seems to tell us a lot about the importance of nature that there are certain things about being a biological boy, for example, that can't be overwritten by raising someone as a girl. Let's evaluate the nature-nurture debate. We've already looked at functionalist views from, for example, Tolkien Parsons. This is the idea that nature plays an important part. Now remember, functionalists believe very strongly in the importance of socialization. So they're not entirely on the nature side. They just think that there is a biological basis for our behavior and that societies that go against our biological needs will become dysfunctional. As you would expect, Marxists take an opposite view. In fact, the biological basis for society, they would see as part of ruling class ideology, the notion that some people are born better or wiser or cleverer than others and therefore deserve to be in power because of their ancestry, their bloodline, uh, is something that justifies inequality. Marxists are often opposed to the idea of IQ testing and selective schooling, and of course, hereditary privileges, like the royal family. Feminists will see biological differences as part of a patriarchal ideology. Biological differences are often used to justify oppressing women, particularly restricting women to being homemakers and mothers the way that Torquem Parsons recommends. Biological differences often justify male aggression and abuse when boys are violent. It's dismissed with the famous phrase, boys will be boys, as if it's in their nature to do this, and so there's no point in trying to stop them. Clearly then, nature and nurture combine in some way. The real question is, is the nature element tiny and, socially speaking, rather insignificant, or is it huge? and unignorable. We need just to take a little look back in time at the concept of eugenics. Eugenics is the belief in the biological inferiority of some groups. It was a popular way of thinking in the first half of the 20th century, and it led to policies to, to sterilize some groups so that they wouldn't have children and 
pass on their bad genes. Eugenic policies culminated in the Nazi genocide in the Second World War and the Holocaust. And so ever since then, the idea of nature as an explanation for social differences has been viewed with a lot of suspicion. It's kind of stained by the legacy of eugenics. Let's take a look at some possible exam questions on the nature nurture debate. Obviously, question one, the six marker, could ask you to explain using examples the nature nurture debate. Two marks there for explaining what the nature nurture debate is, maybe with some good terminology about maturation or social construction, and the other four marks for offering examples. Question two will introduce you to two sources, a picture usually and a small piece of text. Here we've got a picture of a pair of identical twins who are both basketball players. You can look at that and say what you see, and you could say that possibly these two young men have both inherited a skill at basketball. On the other hand, it's also possible that they were raised in the same household and learned to enjoy basketball. Looking at source B, you've got a description of the famous twin study into the, the gym twins. And since that they weren't raised together, it's difficult to see how nurture could account for these coincidences. Question three is the essay outline and briefly evaluate the view that nurture is more important than nature. You're unlikely to get that question the other way round. Sociology is the study of society, and therefore all sociologists are particularly interested in nurture, and perhaps less interested in nature. They'll leave that to the psychologists. This essay is best answered by making three points about nurture or nature. You could refer to socialisation, you could refer to ideology, and you could bring in twin studies and some evaluation addressing which view is likely to be the correct one. Are we more nurture than nature? Are the two things equal? Or are we born that way? I hope that has been a valuable overview. You can find more about the nature nurture debate in my study guide on socialization, culture and identity, and also in the combined guide with youth subcultures. They're both available from Amazon, and the link is in the description below. Sociology Robot